Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm here to do a book review of I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. And this is by Austin Channing Brown and this is what the cover looks like. And yeah, so this book is not long at all. This book is 100 and like 82 pages. So 182 pages. It is nonfiction, um, but it is more so that's classified as like social science, um, discrimination and race relations. And in some areas it's in the inspirational or faith because this is geared towards Christ Christians or um, those within the Christian faith. Um, and basically, the author, she does a good job of setting up the tone of explaining what it's like to be a black person and a black person within Christianity who also um, is in white spaces a lot. Um, it's not just that. It could be compared um, a lot to Tana Hesse Coates' Between the World and Me, um, but more so like a female Christian <laughs> experience um, within that. I gave this four reads um, on good... Pff, I gave this four reads. I gave this four stars on good reads. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. The book starts off a little bit, not slower, but a little bit more like you're thinking you're going to hear her life story. But really what she's doing is just setting the tone to kind of give you an idea of what her background is. And then you just dive into various chapters of different social settings, whether it be um, navigating the world within school, within college, within um, the workforce, um, within just regular everyday scenarios on the train, wherever you are, um, and what that is like. But additionally, it's not just so much more of expressing what it's like, but it's also offering solutions on what rec um, reconciliation really looks like. What does it really look like to be, you know, for justice and basically to not get trapped into the idea of using your platform or using social structures, structures to get rid of white guilt. That's not what justice is about. Um, and kind of just seeing what real racial equality looks like and having those conversations. What I thought was very, very interesting is that she actually is a speaker and a practitioner who helps schools, nonprofits, and religious organizations practice genuine inclusion. And, you know, she talks a lot about her experiences on working with these organizations, Christian organizations who say, you know, they want diversity and they want inclusion and, you know, they want a, um, reconciliation and all that other stuff. But what does that really look like? And to really get to the heart of that and really to get the, to the heart of the church and showing that, you know, the church has to change. Like it just has to. I thoroughly enjoyed a lot of these chapters i took some things from this you know when i was reading it initially i was just thinking you know i agree with that okay yeah yeah i heard that before but then some of it's like wow that's a good way to counter or challenge it's really kind of like a guide on how to have black i'm still here black dignity in a world made for whiteness how to not have to water down or tone down um your message how to navigate when you're getting all this pushback and how to basically stand in your truth and stand in your black dignity regardless of who is opposing it. So I thought they were very practical examples and um, just really, really a really good structure of how to navigate some of those and some life lessons and experiences that she had firsthand um, on how to combat that. I thoroughly related to this book in some aspects because um, Shortly after graduating college, I joined a church that was so transformative for myself. Like, it fed my spirit. It really helped me gain a closer relationship with God and with Christ. I was a part of small groups. I actually held small groups at my house. I was, um, you know, volunteering. I was really, really active and for the first time really felt that strong sense of community within the church. The church was led by a white pastor, but it was a multi ethnic 
group makeup or whatever you call it. it was diverse it was diverse but it wasn't necessarily inclusive which i slowly but surely began re realizing this was kind of around the time where trayvon martin and um you know kind of like ferguson different things were kind of transpiring throughout the years while i was there and um no it was pre-ferguson but um post trayvon martin kind of times and you know it was little things that i would notice that the pastor would start saying and like just different things where i was like you know this isn't inclusive or welcoming it's welcoming diversity but it's also championing some of those stereotypes and you know there were black people on the pastoral not really on the pastoral staff but as far as a um, worship leader there was a black worship leader um and you know the congregation would was very diverse so it's easy when you go into those spaces thinking that you know this is a safe space but then i think they could have used I didn't have the language for it at this time, but what she was discussing as to how there's like a blind spot, just because you do mission work and just because you have people or attendance there, when you're, you know, enforcing or kind of encouraging some of the same stereotypes, when, you know, there the pastoral staff doesn't necessarily reflect the congregation. It's like, wow, I really do like this church. I love the community. I love all this, but I just can't be here anymore because it's too stressful and I'm scared of what might be preached this week or what reference may be made as far as, you know, saying that we just need to get over it, you know, preaching that basically racial reconciliation comes from us understanding, us as in minorities, understanding like we have to let that hurt go and allow God to help us forgive and to forget and to move on versus really getting to the core of the root of the issue of what we can do to stop the racial injustice. There was actually a series on racial reconciliation and that's kind of when I actually dipped out of the church simply because the focus was not on how you know white people can own up to the fact that there is racial injustice in this country and something has to be done about it and we need allies and what you could do to help support this change it was more so on getting the black members in that church to forgive to open their heart up to not have this hatred or this anger in our heart or this um whatever to let that go and to not basically see color and to forgive and to be grace have more grace and all that other stuff and that is not what should be the focal point the focal point should be the behavior that needs to change and the behavior that should change is the actual the racist structure and you know the racial inequality in this world um so it's just interesting how you know that dynamic has always played out and i felt like the book does a good way of drawing that point blank period without sugarcoating anything but offering tangible solutions and tangible steps on getting closer um i just really thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed this book and i feel like this is a definitely a good read if you are you know white black whatever if you're christian anyone who wants to see kind of like actionable steps on making the world that much closer to a better place whether we will see it in our lifetime or not i doubt we will see it in our lifetime but hopefully you know generations to come will see the fruit of our labor like we're seeing the fruit of the labor of those who came before us i would say some of my favorite chapters were um ain't no friends here whiteness at work creative anger those were probably my favorite ones yeah and we're still here so oh and standing in the shadow of hope so, so i felt like this was a very well-rounded and probably the most well-rounded um dissections of that within this anyways have you read this book um if so what were your thoughts on it okay love and light and i'll see you guys in the next one bye